So um, yeah, I'm Matt Dukes, I'm Head of Product at the Office of National Statistics. Um, talk's going to kind of go like this, I'm going to tell you the funny bits, which is the background, then I'm going to get slightly more serious, but never that much. So I'll talk about the visions and ambitions of our project, how we took a very militant approach to user research and engagement, um, some of our lessons learned, and I'm almost certainly going to run out of time for questions, but I'll answer them after. So, background. So, um, I have to say this. The Office of National Statistics is the, largest, the UK's largest independent producer of official statistics. The thing we, put, we, we pressure on is that we are independent. So, we, we answer to no government department. Um, we answer directly to Parliament, essentially. Um, that's been hard work with recent political activities that, as a civil servant, I'm still not allowed to mention. But um, I can tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so it's been quite hard work seeing statistics used and misused, often by both sides. Um, we're not massive. We get about 500,000 uniques. So enough that you've got to take it seriously, but you know, nothing like a, a really kind of giant web scale site. Um, to the absolute disgust of our statisticians, <laughs> the most popular thing we do is a list of baby names every year. And to the delight of my um, design team, we now do this kind of Game of Thrones um, thing every year, and we've just won an information that's beautiful award for this. Um, this is the most popular thing we do every year, saying how many people have been named after dead characters in Game of Thrones, basically. Um. <laughs> so, um, so we launched a new website on the 26th of February this year. Um, I had actually already run away to New Zealand and I answered all the Twitter queries and complaints and everything on the launch, sat on a boat on a lake in um, Queenstown, but I spent so much time on Twitter that the captain of the boat complained that I wasn't taking his talk seriously, so, um, but there was 4G, so it seemed like a good time to do it, um, but this is kind of what it looks like, um, but this is the main point of the story. So. Um, the ONS website was, there was a, I'd been working at ONS about a month. I got up on a Saturday morning, a little bit blurry headed as you tend to be, checked my um, Twitter account and I had about 120 mentions. So I kind of assumed I'd done something really stupid and forgot the night before. But as it turned out, people knew I'd joined the ONS and that day, Tim Harford, anyone come across Tim Harford? Okay, so he's a famous economist. He'd written an 850 word article in the Financial Times just saying how bad the ONS website was. <laughs> Nothing else. And this was his main quote. The ONS website was a national embarrassment. And I hadn't really done my due diligence when I took the job. I just wanted a new job. So I wasn't aware of the kind of history. Because it was more than just that. So bad as any of your sites could have been, I bet they've not had a parliamentary investigation into how bad the website was. <laughs> Literally, our board and our chief exec got pulled to Parliament, to PAC, to the same place as um, the guy who ripped everyone off of BHS was taken, um, to explain why things were so bad. And the really worried, do you remember there used to be this meme, um, you had one job, lots of kind of things floating around the internet? This is the problem. Apparently, we made stats really hard to find. I know we don't really have anything else to do, and we made stats really hard to find. Um, in a best-selling book by um, a guy called Simon Rogers, who used to run the data blog for um, The Guardian, he said the ONS website was the world's worst website. <laughs> and this is genuine feedback. <laughs> so, so someone filled in a 40-question user satisfaction survey, completely straight, not messing around, filled in everything properly, and this was the free text thing they wrote at the end. Using the ONS website makes me want to cry. Um, so yeah, so all this happened. We had terrible kind of feedback, terrible kind of reputation on the website. Um, other stuff happened, technical stuff, bad days, sites disappearing, massive crashes, big technical problems. And in the end, it turned into a situation where um, I was taken into a meeting room and told it was my job now to build a new website but do it quietly. We didn't really have permission at this point to do it. So I was given the opportunity to build my own team, separate to the, the current 
um, web team and to go ahead and investigate how we could build a website and how to move it forward, taking all the lessons from the government digital service and all the other things that, that was going on at the time and see what we could do. So we kind of tied it into the ONS strategy. And the big thing, the thing that I always cling to at the ONS strategy is this idea that we're about improving debate. We're about improving decision making. That's the point of statistics. Statistics in of themselves, it doesn't matter, but improving debate and improving decision making is what it's all about. So we wanted to create a site that made that easier, made that more possible. And there's a very famous um, data visualization expert called Edward Tuft. And, he ha and we completely misused one of his quotes. So our big thing was we would make a site that was data intense, but design simple. And I forgot to bring the stickers, but I was going to give you all stickers that were about data intense and design simple. But there you go. Um, and our big concept, our big vision, was this idea that Stephen Dunn, while he was at The Guardian, when The Guardian had their big um, open Guardian, open API kind of idea, was this idea that you would be of the web, not on the web. That everything would be available as HTML, as APIs, and it wouldn't be about sticking PDFs and Excel spreadsheets. We basically published Excel spreadsheets, a lot of Excel spreadsheets. So it was about becoming um, of the web. So yeah, so everything that we do, every single page on the ONS website is now available as JSON, and you just um, add slash data to any URL and you get access to it. Nothing separate, we don't run a separate API, we just, our website is an API. Um, and I know, um, I think it was last year or the year before, Ross Ferguson spoke about his time at um, Government Digital Service and some of the things there. GDS have done a lot of great things. I've done a few things that have made my life miserable as well, to be perfectly honest, over the last couple of years. But the most important thing they ever did was really early on, which was their 10 design principles, um, which is gov.uk forward slash design dash principles. That's how much I know it. Um, and they were the most important things, because this is a, a core way of approaching how to run digital projects. And my, but even then, there's only two of them that I fundamentally care about. One is this, which is the temp which is make things open, it makes things better. And then there's the one that everyone knows, which is start with, user, start with needs, user needs, not government needs. And these are the two most important things that GDS ever came up with, essentially, as far as I'm concerned. This is, where the, this is what was important. So we took that and we decided to put our own spin on it. And, this was, and, we, were, and we were fundamentally going to build, do a project that was militant about you, putting users first, a bit too much as it turned out, well, I'll talk about that. And, um, and we would be open to the extreme. So this is our, this is our, this is ONS Digital's first principle. And the big one for us is um, empathy. Because if you spend as much time with a, a bunch of users who hate the website as much as our users hated the website, and a website that made their lives as miserable, and who every bit of their job was about using your site, you, you learn to be empathetic. It's just you can't avoid it. Um, so this is the thing. So we spoke to about 2,000 individuals who represented about 80 organizations, all external users. We um, pissed off an enormous amount of internal people by completely and utterly focusing on our external users. Um, we moved away from our, our traditionally ONS deals with the bank, the Bank of England, we just call it the bank. You know, it's internal, you know, we know them all. So it's the bank and the treasury. That's all we really care about. But we spread it out to everyone who actually had to use our site every day. And we did some pretty major things. So um, we threw away all the navigation. So I was talking earlier about kind of making some changes. We didn't ask anybody, we just threw it all away. We spoke to users, we spoke to 300 users, and then we launched it. We launched a completely new information architecture for the entire site, um, which was a little bit radical, but we had user back in. Um, and we have, like, I hate personas. I once walked out of an IWMW talk a long time ago because someone did a whole talk about personas. Um, I don't really agree with them. Um, I find a lot of the time they're just kind of, they're just best guesses. Um, you don't get away with guesses at a, a research type place like ONS, so we had to do a lot of kind of in-depth research behind it. But we built these three personas, which kind of just basically show a continuum of um, 
of expertise from people who just visit the site one-offs, who don't really know a lot about statistics, right up to people who, God bless them, spend their entire life on the ONS website dealing with our data. And we use, this, we use these um, personas not for insights into themselves, we use them to help recruitment of real people. So we never ever base any decisions on personas. We use personas strictly just to decide we were getting the right kind of people in. Um, and because of these personas, I was able to make one of those decisions that you're really lucky to get away with. So we had this really broad audience, which I was fundamentally terrified by. And I said, we're not going to do the citizen bit. We're not going to do the everyday bit. It's too complicated. We're going to build a site that helps third parties get that data to those people. The BBC, The Guardian, Full Fact, these people do that stuff better than we could. So we're going to build a site for those people to translate our stuff for them. Um, that was a fundamental change. We'd always been a broad house previously at ONS, trying to be all things to all people. And I just said, we can't do it. I certainly couldn't work it out. We did slightly fake it, though. So we built a blog called ONS Visual, which is where we put all of our cool data visualizations and stuff. So visual.ons.gov.uk, if you want to see nice things in D3. We do some quite nice stuff there. Um, and we did the whole thing in the open. So we had a public beta from three months in. So basically, as soon as we had run-in infrastructure, we made everything public. Put it on beta.ons, we publicized it. We deployed every couple of days, but we did everything in the open. So it, sometimes it disappeared, sometimes it broke. We added content to it 24 hours behind the main site, so it was never really out of date. We did hide it from Google, but if you knew it was there, you could find it. Um, we did a lot of guerrilla testing. I, 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 again, it's one of these things I don't think you get that much value from guerrilla testing a lot of the time. It's good for quite quick, sharp answers. But if you've got a lot of big problems to fix, it's not structured enough and it's not, you don't get enough from it. But we had quite a lot of time. If anyone here from Southampton Uni, yeah, we went to your bar and bothered some of your students um, and handed out some free drinks and stuff. And then we went to the um, World Statistical Society Conference and a few other things and we kind of just went out and grabbed people it was good for just getting quick answers. We had, this, this is such a, um, this is one of the things. So critical friends, we had this, a group of critical friends. And when they started, they were mainly critical and really unfriendly. Um, and it was more a stakeholder thing than it was a um, user research thing, really. These were people who had, um, big channels from which to criticize the ONS. They were um, at the Financial Times, at the Guardian. They worked for high profile departments, for the banks um, in the city. And so we brought a lot of these kind of important people together and we asked their opinion. We gave them early sight of things. Um, we started off very much from that point of view. As it turned out, they became incredibly useful because they, they were senior enough that they had staff, they had people, they had the right kind of people we needed to speak to, worked for them, so they could tell people to help us. So suddenly it became easier to recruit. Um, so who here does kind of user satisfaction surveys and that sort of thing? People kind of do that sort of stuff. I've always done a bit of that. ONS is essentially a massive survey house with loads and loads of people who studied doing surveys up to PhD level. So doing them at ONS is an enormous amount of pressure to get the methodology correct every time, to such an extent we don't really do them, because it's painful. <laughs> so we only really did two. We did this one, which was a um, user satisfaction survey, which we've done for years, which GDF actually makes you do. And we did one around terminology, because as it turned out, the language ONS uses wasn't even used by other statisticians. So it was completely, so whenever we spoke to people, they didn't really know what we were talking about. So we wanted to really get under the skin of actually what was a terminology that was more commonly used. As it turned out, most people didn't buy internally. That's the one thing we didn't, were able to sell. So they, we really haven't been able to push that still. Um, I love Loop 11. Has anyone used Loop 11? Loop 11 is this brilliant um, online web tool that lets you um, have one website versus another do the separate the same tasks and stuff like that. It's only a tiny little bit of JavaScript in the header. You can run these really quite cool scenarios. You just shove it out to the web. We've, we've got like 150,000 followers on Twitter or something. You get a few hundred thousand people really quickly. 
do these tests. They're incredibly useful. Um, and chalk mark is one for kind of much smaller. Does this button work versus that button, that sort of thing. But they were both incredible just to keep the cadence of still doing user research all the time. Um, most useful thing and the hardest to do, but I think potentially a bit easier for um, campus-based universities and stuff like that, because some of your users or recent users are, are there and thereabouts, is doing the whole ethnographic thing. What we discovered a lot was that people who were, um, what people told us wasn't actually what we observed when we went to see them. So we did, a, uh, even by going to sit with somebody, you're obviously changing their behavior. But actually, once they got busy and we were there observing, we started to get to see how they did use the ONS website, what they were downloading, what they were using. And it wasn't quite what we expected. A, it was more painful even than they were saying. But also, they were doing things that they'd never really told us about, and they were having problems that they'd never really mentioned, because they'd, they'd built so many coping strategies up over time. So observing was the only way we really learned that. And diary studies, so the most, pop, the most um, helpful people also followed that up by doing diary studies for us. We're talking about how they used the sites when they'd come up with problems. Uh, it was incredibly helpful, this in-depth kind of level of using research. I love A-B testing, fundamentally. I'm such a geek. Um, but it was hard work because you need to get enough traffic to make the test worthwhile. So when we were doing the beta, and it was all on the beta, the reality was you couldn't really trust the experiments. So we were doing this page versus that page and this kind of interaction versus that interaction. But we never really got enough feedback to make it worthwhile. We did learn a lot about running them, though. So now we're running them in live quite regularly. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about some of the lessons we learned. And most of these are painful ones. So um, despite all this work to be open, so I spoke at lots of events. We blogged everything. We were on Twitter. Um, we had the open beta. Um, we were always trying to kind of get things. We did all of our. Um, we wrote sprint notes in public and that sort of things. So everything was open. People still didn't know we were doing it, fundamentally. Like all this shouting, we were shouting into the void, essentially. They were busy. They had reasons for doing the stuff that they wanted to do. So it wasn't getting out there. So if we were going to do it again, and I really never want to do it again, um, we have to make better use of traditional marketing channels and communications channels to make sure people are aware. Um, our users were brilliant. At no point did we ever offer incentives. So a lot of times with user research, people get an Amazon voucher or something like that. We offered nothing, ever. We weren't allowed to. The civil service, it was against the rules. So we couldn't even pay for expenses. So people shipped themselves around, came to our different user research sessions. They were so deeply engaged with making things better that all we had to do was ask. And a lot of the time, that's true. If you've got kind of professional users and you've got people who are in, deeply involved in your site, it's a real lesson that we learned. Um, so before, the, before we launched, there was probably about 20% of people who fundamentally, deep down, hated the ONS website with a passion that only, I only say for Bristol City. Um, and then we launched a new website, and now we've got a new 20% of people who hate the website. So we fixed lots of stuff, but you can't fix everything for everybody, and trying it is the, is the route to madness. So um, there's a guy called Martin Bellum who works at The Guardian. He writes quite a cool blog. And he um, used to be at the BBC and stuff like that. And one of his big things is that it doesn't matter. Whenever you launch a new website, there's certain things people will say. Um, Did you let the work experience kid design this? It looks like Fisher Price. Um, if, it ain't if it ain't broke, why fix it? There are certain things that will always fundamentally be said whenever you change a website. You just have to learn to get a thick skin and cope with it, um, or run away to New Zealand. Um, and people dislike change. Even if they agree with what you did was an improvement, and most of our people did, they just spent five years learning how to cope with one site, and we changed everything. So we did 145,000 redirects. So we didn't leave anyone kind of cut asunder. 301 redirects, as far as the eye could see. Um, but it still changed the routes that people were used to using things. Even people who said, this is actually much more straightforward and your search is much better, complained. 
because they knew exactly how to do things previously and we pulled the rug from under them. Because to wrap back, even though we were open, not enough people knew we were doing it. And this is a big one. Um, so we spent like a year on the build, nonstop. Um, and then we launched. And in the two weeks after we launched, we got more feedback than we got the whole rest of the time we were doing it. Um, so we've got a continuous improvement team. We've, we're ongoing. We're, we're, we continue to work. We had like a day to celebrate launch, and then we got back down to it. But launching is just the first step. There was always a tradition, I think, that you ran projects or programs to get something done, and then you finished it, and then you passed on, and, it, and there was never any real kind of investment to continue to develop and stuff. Our backlog is now bigger than it was at any point since we initiated the project because there's so much that people, now that users are using it every day, there's so much we know we can now improve. Um, and this is something that I fundamentally screwed up. So in my absolute um, eagerness to be completely user-led and to be user-driven, I basically handed off our internal users for months and just said, we know what you want, We've, you've told us before, we're listening to them. But that kind of put us in a really sticky position because not everything is user-led and not everything can be decided by web statistics, by web analytics. And it made it quite difficult for us to make those strategic decisions and also to have the right people on board to support us when we needed them, particularly with the content migration. So we didn't handle that as well as we could have. We did a lot. Don't get me wrong, we didn't completely ignore them. We had kind of champions in different business areas and stuff like that, but we, could have, we should have had much more time spent on kind of internal communications. And I think this is something that um, I definitely would do differently in future, and I would have somebody from the business areas much more directly involved. We, we ran a multidisciplinary team without a statistician, and that was a massive error. Um, and this is one of the things that has been helpful for us. So you launch this site, and everyone goes, but where is this? What about that? Kind of just always, everyone's got a pet thing that they're absolutely sure they should, you should have done. So the most useful thing we did, just using Trello initially, is we put our roadmap public. We spent some time working out what our priorities were. And it was all quite loose, and it's all quite high level, and obviously it moves. But we put it up there. And it's, much, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally useful as a stakeholder management tool. Because every time someone asks, everyone's aware that they just point people to this. So there's no mixed messages. Expectations are handled. It's all there. It's all open. And it allows people to understand what the pressures are. Um, and because of, of the fact that we are user-led, if there's a lot of people see it and, they, and they're talking about the fact that they think certain things should be more prioritize than they are, then we will respond to that. Um, so working this way is incredibly rewarding, but it was really hard. So we did user research every two weeks. We went out to see users every two weeks for the whole time for over a year. Um, every user story, everything was completely built around doing, being completely driven by this, working completely agilely. Um, we did the whole two pizzas thing with the team, so we never had a team bigger than you could feed with two pizzas, so it never got bigger than 12. Um, and then, to be fair, one pizza is just me. Um, so we, we had a small team who worked really hard. Um, I learned more, like I've been doing this, I've, I've never had any other job but being a, a kind of web manager since there was a web, basically, so something like, I started doing this in 95 or something. Um, and it was the most rewarding job I've ever done. It was, I learned the most doing this. I also ended up really sick and burnt out and um, just in pieces, basically. So I don't necessarily recommend working in the manner that I did, but it is really um, incredibly useful and, and, and brilliant. You get so much understanding of your users. You really do become, you want to do a great job because you see the pain, you see the challenges that they have. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, I don't know if there's any time for questions, but if there is, questions. Cheers. So does anyone have questions? Was that really the A to Z of every possible user testing technique as written you didn't use? It just seemed the most thorough I've seen. Um, 
this, everything that we thought we could do. We only had one user researcher as well, which was pretty good. So we just, they're not in great shape. <laughs> but, we, but there was this thing basically that we just, um, when, you, when, you, when user experience is so low, you have to try every kind of trick in the book. And the reality is, a lot of it we just tried and it didn't necessarily work out great, which is what I was saying, some of them weren't brilliant. Um, but the, the lab-based testing and the ethnographic stuff were both incredibly useful and, and have influenced pretty much everything since. Um, I was at the, uh, a, a Bristol for an event uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was, and you were supposed to be there and you weren't. And you said you couldn't because your website, uh, there was, I think the website had fallen over. Yeah, yeah that and, sounds about right. And, and I think um, you told a wonderful story about how you responded to that because you were working late, tweeting on behalf of the, uh. the website. Would you like to share with the community the approaches you took when you were doing that? Oh, look, I really wouldn't recommend this. So um, the website went down completely. That is what actually caused all of this. So the site died for 11 hours. The day after we released GDP, which is quite important, and the day before we were going to release data on zero hours contracts for the first ever time, so just slightly political. So everyone was kind of going mad on Twitter saying that um, we'd done it on purpose and we were government stooges. Um, so the, my Twitter, so I, 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 can, I had at the time responsibility for lots of stuff, including Twitter, but my Twitter team were getting a real hammer in. So I decided for the first time in years, so the first time since like, the really early days of like, people having Twitter accounts, I'd be in charge. They gave me the keys. So I um, let them all go home, and we were working until about 10 or 11 that night. And I decided that I would have some fun with it, and decided that the ONS had become sentient. Um, I was going to answer all the questions if the o as if the ONS was like an AI. Um, to any and everything that anyone asked, basically, no matter whether they were journalists, including people who were quite senior, lots of blue ticks people, and um, just did that for, for, the, for that evening. I, I did a lot of, you know, I, I sent people to the, um, the, fil the kind of archive sites and stuff as well. I answered questions where I could, but I tried to take some of the sting out of it because it had start, you know what it's all like, you've all got experience of this. People say stuff on Twitter they would never say to you. And lots of them were very senior people, acad academics, students, um, people in government, and it was all a bit inappropriate. So I just took the sting out of it all. And it went really well. Um, but ONS is very risk averse. Traditionally, our social media had been links to our stats with the occasional answer to a question about how to find something on the website. And then I went kind of slightly bonkers for six hours. <laughs> So there was some explaining to do the next day. But you know, I'm still there. It was a bit twitchy for a bit. Uh, but it has to be said, they changed the, uh, the password to the Twitter account the next day, <laughs> and I've never had it since. They, they created a new one, ONS Digital, just for me. So it was like only got a few hundred followers, so it doesn't really matter. 